Team Kesteva and YouTube, welcome back to another, unfortunately it's not midweek mini, but it's another civil PE example problem for all of you today. Sorry I'm a little late, I've been traveling just a bit here, but now I'm on a temporary hub. So I told the TAs, make sure you put some flyers up on the usual lecture hall, because we are moving shop and we're going way other side of campus, so hopefully you're not just sitting around in the auditorium waiting for me. We're all packed across town. Make sure you subscribe to this team because we are jam-packed. So get your butt in a seat now and let's get going. All right, we're jumping into today's video. All right, so what do we got here? So as we know, it is not just structural that we do here. Um, the PE exam is not solely structural based. You can take the structural specific where in the afternoon it's only structural, but in the beginning you still have that general breadth portion of the exam. So we need to know a little bit of everything. In today's example, we're touching on geotechnical engineering and talking about retaining walls. So this is just a very little quick one for you. Hopefully it helps. But then after this, we're doing a full length retaining wall design start to finish. You're going to love that one. So what we have concrete gravity retaining wall having a unit weight of 150 pounds per cubic foot shown in the figure below. Uh, use the uh, Rankine active earth pressure theory. Oh, geez, what the frick is that? And neglect wall friction. The factor of safety against overturning about the toe at point O is most nearly what? So right off the start, like we always do, make sure you identify your question. What are you actually solving for? Don't just start solving things that you know how to solve. That's the question. That's what we need to answer. Um, point O is shown here, so that's great. So the first thing we need to identify is actually that thing that we had a question about, Rankine Active Earth Pressure. Mm, what the heck's going on there? Well, I do not have my CIRM manual with me, but that's where we would dive into, and that's hopefully what you're going to be bringing along to the PE exam. The CIRM, for anyone who doesn't recall, let's jump over, is this guy right here. So this is the 15th edition. That's what I used a couple years back. I think the 16th edition is out now, um, but I know in both of these they're going to have those uh, those theories in the geotechnical section. So again, I don't have my physical one on me, so I can't go to it, but that is where the information would be located uh, really clean and simply. But I will be going to Civil Engineering Bible website to show you what uh, the exact equations that are contained in the CERM manual. So hopefully that helps you out a little bit. So here we are, Civil Engineering Bible. Uh, Right off the bat, kind of strange. This doesn't look anything like a steel manual. And we all know that's the one true Bible. So, uh, heretics. That's okay. Okay, so as we scroll down here, here we go. So, Rankine Earth Pressure Coefficients. And what we need is um, either two cases here. And it's based on the retained soil uh, parameters. You have uh, active earth pressure at a slope with a sloped backfill behind. So, if we go... Back to here, if we were to have backfill that goes up like that, that would be a sloped condition. And if we had that, that means we would use the large nasty one above here with all your coefficients and your beta. And the beta down below, as you can see, is the slope of the backfill as denoted there from a 90 degree plane. So that would be your beta. But in our case, we have a flat slope. So if we go back, we have case number two. So for case where uh, beta equals zero, which we have, you have much simpler, much more trimmed down, all the fats trimmed off of that, uh, active earth pressure coefficient, which is your K sub A value. That's what this is right here. In this example, they've asked to use the Rankine active earth pressure. So that means you need the active earth pressure coefficient. So K sub A equals tan squared 45 minus um, theta over 2. So let's go back and let's use that. So we have K sub A, and let's plug in for that. Well, you might be saying, well, what is theta? Theta is your internal angle of friction, and that is given to us, as you can see right here, as 32 degrees. So theta, we're going to erase, is not unknown. That is 32 degrees. Now we can plug in, we have everything to solve for our active coefficient. So Ka equals tan, and I'm going to rewrite this because when I first learned this, this squared on the outside here kind of messed me up, but I mean, that could be silly for some of you, but for me, it just kind of messed up my flow and making sure I, I squared things properly. So 
I actually write it like this, tan 45 minus, so theta, which is 32 degrees, don't have to change it in any way, it's just 32 degrees goes in there, divided by 2, I square all of that at the end, so that's the same, the same thing, again, silly for some, for me, it just looks better to me. If we solve for Ka, we're going to find that that equals, oh fuck, what does that equal? 0 0.307. And one other thing I want to note, if we go back, say you actually had a sloped backfill and you were in, in, in the exam. Uh, if you look down here, you might say, how the hell am I going to solve this huge frickin' equation here with all the cosines and the betas and the thetas and all that kind of stuff? Like, it's just going to take a long time. Well, what they've done, and this is in your CERN manual, if you go down, and they've included it in this Bible of ours, our heathenous Bible, apparently, uh, they actually tabulated it. So they made tables for both your active earth pressure and your passive earth pressure. We'll get into passive in one second just to touch on, but active earth pressure, here you go, and it's broken up just on the left-hand side, you have beta, so your sloped backfill, so it's just based on how much of a slope that backfill is at, and then what your internal um, coefficient of friction is at the top. Uh, so you just pick both of those and you you drive it down and you don't have to solve that equation. It just is already tabulated for you. So that is a much quicker way to do it. So you could, in the exam, see sloped backfill problems. Don't freak out. It's not going to take you a long time. Use the table. Okay, going to jump back. Now, I did say there was also passive uh, factor there. Well, what is that? So that's Kp. And what passive is, that are all of the soil properties that are resisting the forces for your retaining wall. So that's on this side. Now for our case, we don't have any, but if you were to have, I'm gonna scroll down, a retaining wall like this, and that had slope, and that had backfill over the top of it, you could get some passive pressure that is helping, that is resisting your overturning and your sliding and all that kind of stuff. So um, for your global stability. And that you would slap on K sub P. Those are your passive uh, forces, soil forces, whereas on this side, you can have active or you can have at rest. And if I'm just going to keep going with this, active means that your structure is going to start to yield per design. So you're going to start to deflect your wall. And how I think about it is for K active, that means you'd have active soil because your soil is actually starting to move that wall, so it's starting to slide forward in there. So that would be an active condition. For a passive design, or excuse me, for an at-rest design, it's what you'd think. You have that same wall. Your wall is designed, it, you could have really high tolerances. You don't want anything to yield or deflect. You want it to remain rigid in your design. So that means the soil forces are at rest because they're not going to move. They're not going to start to deflect that wall and start to push forward just slightly. They're going to remain at rest. And that would mean you would apply a different fact, soil factor, um, K sub O. And today, I'm not going to give you that equation, but that's those are the three biggies. You have active earth pressure, you have at rest earth pressure, and then you have passive earth pressure. So hopefully that helped a bunch of you. But a little side tangent that didn't particularly pertain to this problem. I'm going to get rid of this stuff. Okay, so we have Ka. We're back up. Now we just get into that, uh, that overturning moment versus the resisting moment, and then we'll find our factor of safety. That's it from here, and that's a very structural related uh, topic, so we should be able to knock this one out. So let's start with M overturning. I like to go M o sub OT for myself, but and we're going to have the following forces. So we have a uh, backfill here. So I'm just going to draw what the forces translate to. So you're going to have triangular loading under flat surcharge load. And it's 8 feet tall. And we have a soil density of 110 pounds per cubic foot. So what these forces will actually come out to be is going to be your density times your Ka value times your depth, I'm just going to call it D, and then times 
your width of retaining wall that you're designing for. It's very common that you just design like a, like a concrete slab per foot strip of wall or slab. So in our case, our W is just going to be one foot. Okay. And then, so if we're still not following, I can do a little, try to at least, three-dimensional. We're going to take just a slice of pie right out of the retaining wall, and that's going to be one foot. So that, that little sliver of retaining wall is what we're going to design for, and then we know that we can apply one foot width of forces on that and design for it, and then that would tell us that our whole retaining wall is fine. Hopefully, you're catching on there a little bit. But So to get that force, we have to do the following. So we have, uh, what do we call it? Lambda or uh, T, yep, total equals 110 pounds per cubic foot. And you'll see how this the one foot strip helps with units. We have a one foot width, so one foot. Then we have a height of eight feet. And then we have K sub A, which is 0 0.307. And that should be everything we need. So now for, and to make it simpler for some, just so we're on track, we can write that as pounds per cubic foot like that. So if we cross out foot, cross out foot, cross out the cube and make it just a one, that's going to equal 270 PLF pounds per lineal foot. And that's going to be at the bottom. So now if we draw so now if we draw our wall, we have a force like this. We know at the bottom it's 270 PLF, and at the top of our wall it's zero PLF. And there you go. Now that just... That's, we can solve for that, right? So the way that we can do this, if you're like, oh, man, that's going to be a difficult like centroid to find and all that kind of stuff. Well, not really. Remember, triangles is just one third from the base um, if you sum all the forces together. So what we can do is find, like I said, I'm, I'm going to do this in green. We can find the resultant force. We'll call that F. And F is going to equal 270. PLF times 8 feet, because we're just finding the area, the area of that triangle. So times 8 feet, and then times 1 half. That is going to be force, which equals 1,080 pounds. And go back to red. And we know that our moment arm is just 1 third of D, which is going to equal 8 over 3. So now moment over turning equals 1080 pounds times 8 over 3 feet, which is going to equal 2,880 pound-feet. Okay, so that's our overturning moment. So now, if we scroll back up here, now what's our resisting moment? Do we have anything that's resisting that moment? Or, I mean, we need to, right? That's why we have a retaining wall there. So what is actually retaining? I'm going to do blue now. The actual wall itself is just a gravity wall. So the weight of the wall is helping counteract and resist that overturning moment. And you might say, well, that's a weird shape again. That's gonna, it's going to take a long time to figure out that centroid. Just break it up into basic geometry, OK? So what you can see here, what I'm doing, you actually have a rectangle and a triangle that make up that shape. Just solve the moment for the resisting moment for both of those shapes, add them together, and then we'll be done. So let's go, we have one and two, OK? And since we have two foot thickness at the top and four foot thickness at the bottom, we know that the bottom thickness of our triangle is two feet. And they're both the same height. They're both eight feet tall. So I'm going to scroll back down to the bottom. I'm going to change the red. We're going to do moment resisting. And we're going to do area one. It's going to equal eight feet tall. It's going to be two foot wide, and then because it's a triangle, you multiply by half. So that's the area, and it has a width of one foot, because we're designing per foot width, right? So that's going to be our, our area per foot of wall. That's going to equal eight cubic feet. Area two is going to be eight feet tall, two feet thick, 
not divided by half because, or not, not, yeah, divided by two. And it's, again, one foot thick of wall. And that's going to equal 16 cubic feet. Now, we know that each of those need to be multiplied by um, the unit weight of concrete, which equals 150 pounds per cubic foot. That, if you multiply cubic feet by pounds per cubic foot, that gets you just pounds, which is great, because that's the force of our resisting moment. So what we'll do is, if we go down a little further here, I just really want to draw this one out for all of us. So we have that. So now we have about 0.0. Um, area 1 is going to have a force 1, and area 2 is going to have a force 2. So that's the summation of their weights. F1 is going to equal 8 times 150 pounds per cubic foot. So that's going to be 1,200 pounds. F2 is going to be double that, so 2,400 pounds, because the area is just double, so that's easy. And now what's our moment arm? Our moment arm is from point O. For this one, we know that it's one-third the distance from the base. In this case, our base is, I'm going to do blue, is along that face. Or... So it's, it's one-third distance from that base, or it's two-thirds from point O. So we know that that total span is two feet. So we know that the moment arm is two-thirds of two feet. And then the other moment arm for F2 is going to be two feet plus one-half the distance of the thickness of the, tri of the rectangle, which is another two feet. So it's two feet plus one half of two, which is one. One plus two equals three. Oh, so our M resisting is going to equal two thirds of two is four thirds. F1, we know is 1,200 pounds. So 1,200 pounds times four thirds feet plus. 2,400 pounds, that's the force at F2, times 3 feet. And resisting is going to equal 8,800 pound-feet. All right, so we have our resisting moment and our overturning moment. Let's see, in order to get factor of safety, which is what we're searching for, that's just going to be moment resistant over moment overturning. What's our moment overturning? Let's go see is 2880. Okay, so 2880. Uh, excuse me. 8800 over 2880. That's going to be 3.05. That, we'll go green, is our answer. Let's go back up to the top and see what we got. I'm going to say that's that's looking like a 1 or <laughs> That's looking like an A to me, 3.1. So 3.05, you round that up to 3.1. Nothing else comes close to that. That is going to be our answer today. I am satisfied. I hope you're satisfied. If you have questions, let me know. We're at the end here, so leave, leave a like. If you made it all the way through and you're feeling real confident of that, you know, that little portion of geotechnical engineering, fantastic. That's why we're here doing this. And... If you'd like more of these or something similar to this or have questions, always leave a comment. That's great. Or, you know, continue to, com or continue to contact me on the email I've provided. That always works as well. But until next time, this is Rich with Kesteva. Happy holidays. I'll see you all later.